proclaim it. An unnamed Twickenham member grabbed me before worship and shared that his grandsons had been asking him to take them camping and fishing and said, hey, you've got all this set up here. Uh, Would it be okay to just bring them up? And I was okay with them using the tents, uh, but I had to draw the line when he wanted to stock the baptistry with catfish. I just said, no, we can't do that. Maybe largemouth bass, but not catfish. May of 2002, Leonardo Diaz, a Colombian hiker and mountain climber decided to do a serious adventure. So he and some friends decided that they were going to attempt uh, a summit on Nevado del Ruiz, which is a dormant volcano in the Andes. And they were doing fine until the second day when a huge blizzard came in, a whiteout, and Diaz got separated from those he was climbing with. And at first he was okay, but then he got disoriented and could not find his way, nor the people he was climbing with. And after two days, the novice climber soon began to run out of rations and suffer from the bitter cold. And although he had a cell phone in his backpack, uh, as luck would have it, his prepaid minutes had expired. And with no way to signal for help, guess what, the hiker began to realize, knowing was he lost, that he was not going to make it. Why is this such a tragedy? Why do we resonate with this? And, and why are we so broken up when we are physically lost? But yet sometimes we just kind of take a pass at those that are spiritually lost. How much more tragic is it for those that are found but yet remain lost in the Lord? In our series entitled, with ever-increasing glory. Last week, we began climbing the mountain, and we're looking at 10 stops on the journey that leads to maturity in Christ that are laid out by George Barna in his research on Christian discipleship. And we talked about stop number one. It's hard to believe, but there are those that are ignorant, and this is not in their ability to learn, but those that are ignorant in their understanding of God. They don't have a concept of God, And therefore, they really don't have an accurate understanding of right and wrong. Because if there's nothing to base it off of, who's to say what's right and what's wrong if there's no truth? And that's, he he said, right around 1%. Well, a larger percentage of 16 is those that understand the concept of God. And they understand that. And they know there's a right and wrong. And that people say what they're doing is wrong, the lifestyle that they've chosen. But yet they remain indifferent. Well, what's the next logical step? Where does this progression lead? Well, hopefully those that that remained indifferent for a long enough period of time, the Lord begins to work on their heart. As Steve mentioned in his communion thought, this pressing down that the Spirit that the Lord sends will hopefully drive them to start asking some questions. They move beyond a mere awareness of the concept of sin to start asking some what-if questions. Start looking at some of these possibilities. Like, what if my Christian friends are right? There truly is a God in heaven. And if that's true, that there is a God in heaven, what if he's not happy with the way I'm living my life and and the sin that's there? Another question would be, what if my wrong choices are impacting the quality of my life? Because there's a way to live that's laid out in the good book. And I haven't been doing that. Is that the reason I'm in this condition? And finally, what if there is a hell? Am I in danger of going there? So these become some of the questions you begin to ask. And are you willing to risk it? And these people are at stop number three. They move beyond being ignorant and indifferent, and they become concerned. Concerned. Possibly wondering what's going on exactly here. So this morning, I want us to hear from those that are concerned in their own words. So we're going to watch a clip from a film of an online movie called the 180 Movie. You can watch online. That's designed, this man on the street is trying to convince people to do a 180 in their beliefs about a lot of social issues, but also about their relationship with God. In this clip we're about to watch, right before this clip that we're seeing, the interviewer asks the person, are you a good person? And number two, do you deserve to go to heaven? And all but one person on the film answers affirmatively, yes, I'm a good person, and yes, I deserve to go to heaven. Let's see how this...
flip goes. I'm going to warn you, it, it's a little bit rough, some of the people. Lies but you told in your life? Oh, I don't know, thousands, I guess. Lies? Lies? Too many to count. Oh, countless. What do you call somebody who tells countless lies? A liar? Have you ever stolen something? In my lifetime? Mm-hmm. Sure, of course, yeah. Uh, yes. Sure. What do you call somebody who steals things? A uh, thief. So what are you? A liar and a thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Absolutely. Sure have. Absolutely. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. I heard you use his name just before, probably about 30 seconds ago, when you talked about lying. Do you realize that's called blasphemy? When you use God's name as a cuss word, it's very serious? Sure. I guess it is, yeah. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever done that, looked at a woman with lust? Shoot me now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. I like fornicating. It's fun. Yeah, well, you can like raping and bank robbery. It can be fun, but it's not right. Have you ever looked at a guy with lust? No, I'm gay. I commit adultery about every two minutes, maybe. Have you ever looked with lust? Yes. Yes. So, Alicia, by your own admission, you're a lying, blasphemous, adulterer heart. And you've got to face God on Judgment Day. And we've looked at four of the Ten Commandments. Oh, my goodness. You had sex out of marriage. Yep. So listen to this, listen to this David, this is why you don't want to believe in God. You're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterer, fornicator, and you have faced God on Judgment Day, and the thought of being morally responsible to him is abhorrent to you, so you deny his existence. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Makes total sense. So John, you're in big trouble on Judgment Day. By your own admission, you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, adulterer at heart, and a fornicator. Wow. So, will you go to heaven or hell? From the way it sounds, hell. Does that concern you? Absolutely. No, 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 no. You got it all wrong. Uh, guilty. Would you go to heaven or hell? Hell. Does that concern you? Yeah. So does it concern you that if you died today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell? Not really, no. Well, don't try to change me around. I'm the way I am, and I don't give it. You'll be guilty of breaking the commandments. So does it concern you that today, if you died today, you'd end up in hell? Yes. So you're starting to think about your life and how valuable it is? Yes. Does it concern you that if you died today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell? I think God's a loving God, and, and I think he would, uh, he would see my heart. You know, he does, and he sees a liar and a blasphemer and an adulterer at heart. But if you're, if you're repentant, there's something you can actually do because of God's kindness to have all your sins forgiven. Do you know what God did for sinners? Any idea? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth to, um, to die on the cross for the sinners. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Heaven or hell? Uh, hell. Does that concern you? Uh, yes, that's somewhat. You know, God gave you a conscience so you know right from wrong. You know it's wrong to lie and steal and fornicate and blaspheme. It's written on your heart. Do you understand the legal implications of what he did? God's a judge. In his eyes, you're guilty because you violated his law, the Ten Commandments. You're heading for a place called hell, God's prison, without parole, but Jesus stepped in and paid your fine on the cross. That means God can legally dismiss your case because your fine was paid for by another. I don't know. Don't you think it's funny, though, that God will put a nice guy like me to, in hell? But a criminal might say that to a judge, but the judge will do that which is right, even if it's a nice guy. If he's raped and murdered, he's going to get the books thrown at him. And you've violated God's law, even though you might be a nice guy. You're a self-admitted lying thief, blasphemer, adulterer at heart. God will give you justice, but he's not willing that any perish. He's given you something that says, I don't want to die. Listen to a man. You've got a cross in the middle of your eyes. Think about what Jesus did on that cross. Think about how much God cares about sinners, that he'd do that. And in the Bible verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he rose from the dead, and what you've got to do is repent, turn from your sins, trust in Jesus, God will give you everlasting life, he'll forgive your sins. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And the thing that will save you is God's goodness, the Savior, Jesus. He's like a parachute. Turning to a parachute won't save you, but putting it on will. And the moment you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the minute you put your trust in Him, Alicia, God will forgive your sins, dismiss your case, and grant you the gift of everlasting life. God will forgive our sins, including abortion, and grant us the gift of everlasting life. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you have a Bible at home? Yes. Are you going to think about this? 
Yes. So if you died today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you have to do to be saved. You've got to repent, not just confess your sins, but turn from them, and trust alone in Jesus Christ. When do you think you'll do that? Well, um, probably as soon as possible. Wouldn't everybody? Do you have a Bible at home? Yeah, I got a Bible at home. Well, would you please think about this? Yeah, of course. Sure, sure. Why not? Isn't it amazing after just a five, ten minute conversation with some of these folks, all of which came into the interview indifferent. Some remained that way and just shrugged off the questions he was asking. But through the, just a few moments and a few questions, many became concerned. Well, I want to tell you that those that are seeking, those that are looking after and, and, and seeking after God and are asking some of these questions and are concerned are not all rough. Some of them are very good people. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Acts. Acts of the Apostles. I want you to see a person that, that is not like some of the people we saw in this video. Someone that's a good person. I'm still in need of Jesus. Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him and feared. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send in to Joppa to bring back the man named Simon, who's called Peter. And he stayed with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. So let me see if I got this, this right. Cornelius and his whole family are devout, God-fearing believers. He was known as, as someone who gave uh, alms to the poor and took care of those in need. He was even a regular prayer. He was a good man. And yet the Lord sent an angel to Cornelius telling him to go and fetch Peter. Why? Because Cornelius was lost. Do we believe that? Do we believe those that say, I'm a good person? Apart from Jesus Christ, Cornelius and his household were lost. Otherwise, there had been no reason for the Lord to send a messenger. Because he was a God believer. He was devout. He was a good person. And we have people at work. We have neighbors that are good people. They they do the right thing. They clip their hedges. They recycle. They, they help out with the United Way. They go down and, and help down at botanical gardens. They're good people, but apart from Jesus Christ, they do not have a hope of salvation. We have to believe that. While Cornelius is receiving this vision, Peter is getting his own vision. And you guys are familiar with the story. He's up there praying and he has the big sheet that comes down and it's full of the unclean animals. And it's like, arise and eat. He's like, there's no way I'm not going to eat that hoofed animal. I know my Bible, you're not supposed to do it. And so three times he receives it and he says, no, all three times I'm not going to do it. And, and then the sheet goes up into heaven and, and then right about that time when he's still trying to figure all this out, he hears a knock and he's like, wait, is that like part of this vision? Or he hears it again, no, it's my real door. And so the angel says, go answer it and go with the guys that are there. And so he's like, who are you guys? Hi, we're from the house of Cornelius. He sent us. He wants you to come with us to Caesarea. So he's like, okay, let me grab my stuff. And so off they go. And well, let me introduce myself as we're walking along the way. So they show up at Cornelius' house. It's kind of a funny story in, in Scripture because Peter shows up and he says, all right, I'm here. <laughs> what can I do you for? And Cornelius is like, I, I don't know. I, I was praying, and the Lord said, go get you. I, I thought you would know what to do at this point. And then it starts coming together for Peter. Peter's like, oh, this is that vision. 
No longer is the story of Jesus and the hope of salvation going to be restricted to the Jewish people. No, it is now coming to the Gentiles as well. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, Peter begins to tell them the story of the good news, the peace that comes through Jesus Christ. Verse 39, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him, Jesus by hanging him on the tree, but God raised him from the dead, and on the third day, he caused him to be seen. He was seen by all the people. He was not seen by all the people, but the witnesses of whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Do you see how powerful that is? He's sharing the story of Jesus with these people that have never heard it. It's not just Cornelius. He's he's asked his whole extended family to be there too. And his neighbors and his friends, they're all packed in to hear this message from Peter. Everyone who believes in Jesus and puts their faith in his name, receives forgiveness. But without the blood of Jesus, we're lost. We're dead in our transgressions. Even the good people, the God-fearing Cornelius, needed Jesus to be saved. Boy, so do we. Those willing to move beyond just being concerned about sin, go to stop number four, which is those that are convicted. Those that are convicted about their sin and those that turn their life over to Jesus, asking Him to be their Savior. And next week we'll talk about asking Him to be our Lord. And that's exactly what happened that day. Peter's just preaching this this sermon and people are listening. All of a sudden the Spirit, Holy Spirit comes in and he's in the midst of his sermon. All of a sudden these people just start blurting out and speaking in tongues. And Peter stops his sermon and I have to say, if that happens here, I'll stop my sermon as well. So just pray for that, okay? If it happens, well, we're, we're done for the day and we'll just soak it in. But the Holy Spirit starts coming. And what does he say in Acts chapter 10 and verse 46? And then Peter said, huh, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have Look what God is doing among us. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. Come on, let's go be baptized. I want you to experience Jesus Christ and publicly give your life to Him. What's in the message for us this morning? Well, for those that have accepted Jesus, the Lord's calling is the same calling, the same vision that He gives to Peter. You know what you have. You've experienced Jesus Christ. You are a witness. You have a story like no one else. You have a story where someone has passed that faith on to you. You have a conversion experience. Brian Bellamy says it's different than mine. We know what Jesus has done in our lives. We've experienced that conversion process. We have milestones on our faith journey where God has come and encountered us. We have fellowship with believers. We have times when brothers and sisters have been there for us. That's our story. And God continues adding to that story. That's unique to us. We have a responsibility to get that message out as what Jesus means to you, what he's done for you. Why is this so crucial? Well, those stuck. Stop number three. We're at 39%. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are kind of thinking last week, well, if it's just 17%, can we let that group, I mean, it's not even one in five. We add this up. 56% of adults here in America have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. Does that bother you? Over half, well, we're a Christian nation, not according to this. There are a lot of people that that have warm feelings towards God and and Jesus and stuff, but haven't accepted Him and been born again into Christ. 56%. Well, but I don't know what I would say to them. Why don't you start with the story of Cornelius? 
Well, that's not unthreatening. Hey, I want to tell you about a good guy that the Lord says, you're missing something. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. It's not enough to just be good. It's not enough to be moral. It's not enough to be better than others you interact with. The Lord has got to come in your life. It's got to be Jesus that is, is turning you over into a new creation. Well, what if they're ignorant about what I'm trying to tell them? Well, then teach them. Well, what if they're indifferent about it when I do? Guess what? These two groups, it's hard to tell the difference, isn't it? Those that are indifferent and, and those that are kind of searching. Because you really can't tell by their lifestyle because a lot of times they look the same. And who are we to choose that I see this group of people that kind of knows about God, they're not living it out. Well, I don't know. I, I think they're going to be indifferent to it. No, what's the story of the parable of the sowers? Let God figure out what the soil is. You can't see. We throw it out there and allow that to germinate. It's not us. God provides the growth, but good night. We have got to get the message out. We've got to cast those seeds. That's what our job is to do. A tradesman has been doing some work on my house in the house of another member here at Twickenham these past few weeks. And it's allowed the two of us to kind of tag team and spend time with this young man. And even talking with the preacher, he's been very forthright about the details about the worldly lifestyle that he's been living. And when the conversation has turned towards matters of faith, I wasn't sure would he clam up. It was the exact opposite. He's welcomed, and he's talked, and he's warning you to know about how God perceives his life and the choices that he's made. And he wants to know about the Lord and his acceptance and, or rejection of, of where he is in his life right now. He truly is seeking Last week, he accepted an invitation to join us for services and came. Hopefully, we can continue that dialogue and continue sharing about Jesus Christ and he can be brought, brought back to his heavenly Father. That's what I'm praying for. Well, for those that have not taken Jesus to be the Lord of your life, in, in my mind, you share a lot with Leonardo Diaz, the hiker that was lost in the blizzard. You, you're out there and you're trying but you don't have a sense of where you are, the direction you're going, and you really don't have a game plan for it as to how to get there. And guess what? You're just fighting for your life. But if you're open to the Lord, He's not going to leave you there for long. As Leonardo lay in the frigid snow, and he was preparing to die, his cell phone rang. It was a phone solicitor in Bogota, Colombia, wanting to know if Diaz wanted to purchase more minutes on his phone. He's like, are you kidding? Said, we called him to remind him that his cell phone was out of minutes, said Maria Basto of Bell South. He said it was the work of an angel because he was lost in the Andes. So Diaz went on to describe his location on the mountain, was able to give enough accurate information that, guess what, Maria was able to call in assistance and dispatch a rescue team. But the Bell South operator could sense from the sound of his voice that hypothermia was starting to set in. So she made a commitment to call him every 30 minutes, not only to encourage him, but to give him a ray of hope that help was on the way. She did this for seven hours until the team was able to rescue him. See, what ordinarily may have been perceived as a nuisance, this telemarketer calling, ended up saving his life. And folks, until we come to Jesus Christ, often we, we view people that are talking with us about faith as, as kind of a nuisance. I, I don't want you to go there in my life, but it may be a lifeline. Many of us need to welcome that call because we're desperately in need of a Savior. Well, this morning we want to offer an invitation. And for those that have not accepted Jesus Christ, what are we calling you to? We're, we're calling you from a life of, of wondering. We're calling you to a life of security. Security not in us, and not anything that we're doing, but security in the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to come and be made new into a new creation where you know you're secure with the Lord and the Lord is taking care of it through the gift of His Son, Jesus. But this morning, we're also in need of more Marias, folks that are willing to make that call, folks that are willing to start those conversations with folks that we know. And we want to offer a special prayer. If you know someone that's in this 56, if you know some of these folks that are struggling, 
struggling with their life and struggling with who exactly is Jesus. We want to pray for them by name if you want to come and give us that name. Or if you want us to pray for you, we want to do that as well. A prayer for boldness. We've got the holidays coming up, and we know we've got some, some family members that have not given their life to Jesus. We want to pray for you and pray for that situation, pray for boldness. Had a couple come up last week and said, that's our son. He's indifferent to the teachings that we've taught as he's been, been growing up. We want to pray for you, pray for divine intervention, that you can be the one that's holding hands between the one that's struggling and the one that can provide the rescue. Whatever your needs are this morning, we ask you to come forward as we stand and sing.